character in the books. And I told my people, my agent and uh, lawyer and so forth, that I was only interested in television. And they uh, they said, this is a flyer, but go talk to this guy. He's a Swedish television producer, but he knows your books inside and out. And so I had a uh, breakfast with this guy. His name's Henrik Baskin. And he just, just in the course of an hour, impressed me as someone who would be loyal to the books, loyal to the character. And I... And, he was, and it was a long shot at that time. He didn't really have a lot of uh, credentials in the United States television, but I went with him and, and here we are. Uh, we have a seven season show. We're going to do a spinoff. And so I, I chose the right guy. And obviously I chose the right actor and so forth. I, I want to come on to the actor, you know, how you get attached in a moment on that. Amazon's first and longest running original drama series, Bosch we should point out. Mark Bettingham, what about your experience? The first time that, that you thought Thorne was going to happen on oh, TV? You think it's going to happen, then it doesn't happen. I mean, they, they, they actually come knocking quite early. I think that's most writers' experience because, because it's, so, it's so cheap relatively to option a book, you know, for a TV production company. So there's a lot of optioning goes on. And you and quite often a company will option it just to stop the company across the road optioning it, mm. you know, because, and you get very excited when you don't know about it and you get taken out for a posh lunch and then nothing happens. And Mark, and, just uh, explain what, what that means, that phrase optioning a book. What does that well, mean? Well, they pay you, they pay a relatively small sum of money that basically means we, you know, we will try to get this made uh, possibly in a year or possibly in two years, depending on what they pay for. And they sort of don't. I mean, you know, I don't, I actually don't know any writers who, who haven't been optioned at some point. I mean, it just, it just tends to happen, but it's nothing really happens until you get the actor attached. That, that's kind of been my experience. Um, and, you know, that's obviously what we'll, we'll come on to talk to talk sure. about next, I guess. Well, let's get the acting um, side of it. Titus, first of all, the first time you heard the name Harry Bosch. Uh, I, picked up one of the uh, books. I was on a holiday and I grabbed up one of the books recommendation and um, from a clerk in the store and I burned through the book very, very quickly. And that was many, many years. And then the, uh, I was sent the script, the pilot script for Bosch and um, thought to myself, Oh, I remember reading these books and really loved this character. And the, um, and the script was very um, clear. I, I mean, he, I, you, uh, Eric Overmeyer and Michael and everyone that came together and put that together um, created a very, very um, clear view of who the character was in a pilot, which is not often the case. And it's not like I had read all the books up until that point. Obviously, since then, I've read them all, some of them multiple times. But uh, that was the... Uh, I grew up, my, my father had a, a, a huge um, Hieronymus Bosch coffee table book that i used to peruse as a kid um and so the irony was not lost on me and david it's slightly different for you isn't it i understand i mean again i've read stuff online so you tell me whether it's true or not but what i read online was that you actually optioned the books mark's books is that right well no i was attacked by mark's wife on the tube <laughs> <laughs> i was I was waiting at Highgate Tube Station and this woman came over to me and she said, oh, my husband and I love you and, we've, and my, he's written these books. And, and I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, and stuff. And then I did read the books. And then I was in New Zealand. And what happened to me was I was going around online and I sort of, Mark Billingham had put this thing out where he said, if, he, if the books ever came to fruition, to screen, he would like me to play the role. So eventually this got to me via social media. And I thought, oh, okay, well, that's, a, that's an open door I should be pushing at. So I, I read the book then with a different head. And then I got in touch with Mark and I said, let's do it. And we formed a company together. It was, it was very much a joint effort between the two of us. And we sort of uh, had a meeting then about how he and I could get this to the screen and keep it in our, you know, as much in our control as possible. Uh, because like Mark said, you know, these things happen a lot. And sometimes the writer and the, and the idea and the sort of character can, it can get lost in the, the many people that get involved down the line. Uh, so we wanted to keep it very much as Mark had written it and, uh, and the spirit of it as much as we could. So we formed a company together. Uh, and that's how that's where we went. But it was Mark's wife who uh, initially sort of. Well, you, 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 
I think you remember it in a slightly wrong day. You, you fell into my trap. You fell perfectly into my trap because <laughs> from, the, from the day your first book, I mean, you must have had this, Mike, from the day your first book comes out, if you ever do an event, people go, oh, who would you like to play your detective? Who would you like to play Harry Bosch? Who would you like to play Tom Ford? Like, it's all we ever think about. You know, like we're not busy writing books. All we're thinking about is is TV. And obviously, it's a great thing. Don't get me wrong. But you can't spend too much time thinking about it. Um, but I'd seen David in, you know, in Blackpool and State of Play and various things. And all you want is a good actor. I mean, you know, I'm sure Mike would agree. All you want is a good actor. Doesn't matter what they look like. I mean, this is something we should we should talk about probably. But you know, whether you have a fixed idea in your head or whatever. So I just wanted a good actor. So in interviews, I just kept saying Dave's name. Thinking if I say his name often enough, it's it, it's he's going to get to him. You know, it's going to come up. And then I think you'd read the book in New Zealand, I did, and yeah. you'd and you'd, I guess, like the book enough to Google me and found your name and went bloody hell, I'm playing this bloke. And then we arranged to have a meeting at your house. And the day before the meeting at your house was when <laughs> my wife Claire found That's herself right. next to you on the tube and yes. said, "Please don't think I'm mad, but I think you're meeting my husband tomorrow." And then when you opened your front door, you said, why is your wife stalking me? And I thought, yeah. oh, we're going to get on. It's going to be. <laughs> That's when I thought I should be moving house. Yeah. <laughs> I think I like uh, David's story better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do. I mean, talking about, you know, wanting to, to uh, you know, seeing somebody again, it's like it's vanity or something. You don't want to go down that road, at least publicly. But you do think about who could play this character that you spent several months or even years, um, you know, writing about. And, um, you know, um, we got an option to make Amazon and I went into the first uh, casting meeting having zero experience, well, not zero, but almost no experience in television in at least 20 years or, or 15 years or so. And uh, so I very timidly threw out the name Titus Welver because I had seen him in a show and he, and he, uh, can, was showing the interior uh, torment of a character and that's, you know, Bosch is a very internal character and that's what we were looking for. And I was really, you know, I was out of my league, but I said, I like this guy, Titus Welver, and, and I kind of braced myself for that because oh, I left out a part. They gave a list of actors' names and he wasn't on there. So I thought, well, this guy must be a jerk to work with. No one likes him. <laughs> and so I very slowly, you know, raised my hand and said, what, is, what about Titus Welver? And I said, oh, we love Titus, but he's making a movie in Hong Kong. And we had like a six week window to cast the show. And he wasn't expected to come back. And, and we went through six weeks of talking to people, considering people. And we were uh, on a Friday, we were going to say on Monday, we have to push everything back because we haven't found Harry Bosch. And that same day, we heard that he's, he was coming into town um, uh, from Hong Kong and he uh, hung over, but he was going to come in and, and talk to us. And, and he did. And that's not, and he got the job. And, I, and so my instincts were right. Uh, this is a way of me, you know, puffing up my ego by saying I was right. But uh, I think Mike meant to say a jet lag. Different story. <laughs> no, no, Mike, you said hungover. Oh, <laughs> they meant sorry. jet lag. Jet oh, lag, no, yeah. Sorry. Jet lag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I came in. I was still pissed from the flight. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, yeah. I don't, where do I sign? It, it was on hallucinogenics, but it made it for a much more interesting meeting. <laughs> hey, also, one, one thing that's left out of Mark's story is that Claire, his wife, is a television director, and she knows what she's talking about when she would approach David and say, you're perfect for this role. Well, I mean, that, that is the crucial thing of, I mean, so many, so many writers have the unfortunate experience of their character just being given to, you know, the actor of the day, the hot TV actor of the day. You know, the, I don't know whether it's like that in the US, but but here there tends to be. Do you know what I mean, Dave? You know, yeah, I thought that was me, though. I thought that well, was. You no, know, it was you, obviously. It was you. <laughs> yeah, but you know what I mean. I mean the guy. I mean, I mean the guy out the soap opera, or you know what I mean, the guy that. And and we all know writers that's happened to where they go. You know, good news, it's green lit. Bad news, it's actor X. Um, all all I ever cared about was having a good actor, you know, and a smart actor. That's that's all you want. Not not somebody who you know. Uh, is in a massive soap opera or is a uh, and and it for me I mean we, we we got we got we get asked this a lot and I'm sure you do is do, does David's portrayal of Thorne affect the way I write about him 
Uh, and I'm sure you get asked whether, you know, you're seeing Titus when you write Harry now. Um, and I'm not particularly because I didn't ever have an idea of him physically. I knew what the inside of his head was like. I know what he thinks like. But when you're looking out through a character's eyes at the world, what he actually looks like didn't, didn't really matter. And as a result, you don't actually put much description in of him, do you, facially? No, none. None. I try to avoid it completely. Um, do you do that more, Mike, though? Because as a reader of Bosch, I had an image way before I saw the, the Prime show of what Bosch was in my head. No, I, I do very little of it um, myself. I, I mean, I, I write the way I read. I like to create characters as I'm reading them. And so I don't want all these details in a book. So I, as, as a writer, I do the same thing. I, you know, I, there's about 20 Bosch books and probably if you added up all the descriptions, it's less than four pages. Um, and, and it's very repetitive about very basic things. The, the guy I write about in the books is on the evolution scale, uh, you know, 10, 12 years older than Titus, so I don't see Titus. I hear his voice, though, very clearly. Oh, ah, uh, okay. You know, right. Let me just say um, that we've got two options for you to, to get involved tonight. There is a chat window, but it goes like crazy. So um, if you want to put a question to any of our guests tonight, the best way to do that is you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a, just there, there's a Q&A button. And if you hit Q&A, then you can stick a, a question in there for us, which is something that Michelle Ward's done already. And Michelle says, a question for Michael and for Mark. Have you ever watched an adaptation of your work and seen something the screenwriter introduced that you wished you'd have thought of first? Who wants that one first, Mark? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, it's a very funny experience with when, when people adapt your book. I mean, even, bef even before, you know, the actor is attached before it's on, on screen in that, I mean, you have to let them do it. That's the first thing that they're doing a job that you can't do. You're too close to it to go cut that, lose that. You know, if you're turning a 400 page novel into, into, uh, I was lucky, I think three, three hours we got, uh, per novel. Um, that's still a lot of condensing and cutting or whatever. And, um, yeah, there were a couple of occasions when, when the writers of Thorn, I thought, I, I did think I wish I'd thought of that. I have to say the flip side of that, though, there were a couple of occasions. There were, I don't know whether you were present for this, Dave. There were, there were, I only had one major argument, one big <laughs> argument. When I would, there was one line, there was a line of dialogue that Thorn was saying, and I just, it just, do you know the phrase, it made my shit itch? I can't, <laughs> <it> just, <laughs> it just, ah, I hated it. Ugh, just you know. Yeah. Um, it really made my shit itch. So I said, I said, look, I'm just really unhappy with that line of Thorne's dialogue. And they said, okay, well, what would you suggest? And I suggested a line of dialogue and the screenwriter said, oh, Thorne wouldn't say that. And that was the only time, that was the only time I, I lost my temper. <laughs> but, it, you know, yeah, yeah, they did come up with a lot of great stuff, you know? Yeah, I would agree. I mean, you know, the people that they bring in to write and so forth, and the actors also have an input, um, you know, I don't write perfect books, and, and there's been many cases where we dissected a book and found a flaw, and, and so I look at the show as a way of, you know, telling the story better. And it's obviously different, but it, it's better, but, you know, in seven years of Bosch, probably less than, a, less than five times I have said the phrase, um, that makes my shit itch. No, I mean, I, I said the phrase. You can have that now, you can yeah. have that. Harry Bosch would not say that, but Titus should talk about that because Titus, after seven years, you know, has ownership of this character. And more often than not, he will come to me or come to another writer and say, I don't think Bosch would do this or say this. And, and, he's, and he's spot on. He's, he's always right. Titus, do you elaborate on that? Do you feel like you know Harry? Is Harry in the room often with you? Is he on set with you? Do you feel like he's there on your shoulder? Yeah, without sounding overly pretentious. I, I, Certainly. And there becomes a, it, it's a switch that kind of clicks on. And, and there's just sometimes where there's, and it's not that it's a bad line. Um, we have, we have great writers who spend uh, a considerable amount of time and, and thought, you know, before writing things. And, and sometimes it's, it's a great line that would work in another scene, but within the context of the scene that it's playing out, it, it will, it just will not feel like Harry. And it, and it's, um, yeah, it makes my shit itch. I mean, it literally, it, it, it comes across uh, as, as almost a physical reaction, like an allergy um, when it comes in. And uh, yeah, and I run, I run to Mike like I'm dobbing out the, uh, 
<laughs> the the writers and go and say, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think this just doesn't happen. And sometimes it's just the intent. Um, it comes from a good place and it's meant to sort of move it along, but it, it just won't work. Um, and then there's other times where we'll be in the middle of a scene shooting something and um, something may just come out of my mind. Like uh, I call it Bosch Tourette's um, where something that, that will, just feels like something that Harry would say. Um, but, you know, certainly very, very mindful in that way. And I, and I feel, uh, you know, just in, in very intensely uh, protective of, of Harry and, and, um, and certainly of Maddie. There's a, there's a familial um, thing there that, uh, that, that the impulse is always to, to protect that integrity. Mm. Well, D David was always very protective of the character, but also, also made it his own, completely made it his own. I, me I remember we had a discussion mm -hmm. early on where you'd, you'd focused on something. This is amazing. We were, we were just talking about some stuff. And there was one little paragraph in the book. There's one little story that Thorne is telling to somebody about when he gets taken to the football game mm -hmm. by his father and there's a fight afterwards. And you really zeroed in on this mm -hmm. in a way that I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that scene since I'd written it, you know, years and years before. You well, went... it with, yeah, it was to do with the fact that, like, who is your hero? Yeah. And his hero is his father, and his father was shamed in front of him. And he's all his life he's been trying to fix that moment, and a lot of his motivation is about fixing that moment. My thing always, particularly around procedural stuff, is sometimes as the leading actor in there, you'll get exposition. You'll get asked to say stuff that fills in the audience who have come back from an ad break. Or and sometimes writers get a bit nervous or certainly producers get a bit nervous that the audience aren't getting it. And it gets into your mouth to explain it to the audience. And that's when I have my fight. Because I always say, well, why would I tell this guy this? Because he knows it. I'm, and they go, yeah, but the audience don't know it. And I said, but I don't... <laughs> It's not my job. It's yeah, not my job to tell the audience what happened three, you know, two scenes ago. It's always the bit where you go, you find yourself going, "Ah, oh, you're a, a scene of crime officer. I presume you're here to gather evidence." You know, you know that, you've got all this terrible expositional stuff. And we didn't have a lot of that, but that's when I, as an actor, I, that's when my shackles come up because I think it's not my job to explain the plot. I, if it's in character and I'm, it's my character stuff, but I'm not here for the exposition stuff. And that's, that's when I sort of go to war, really. Uh, as I said, in Thorne, we didn't have a lot of that, but there's times when, I'm sure Titus will agree, there's times when you just see that stuff and yeah. it just jumps out. And usually you're able to get that off the page before you even got to the set because it's yeah. just, it's like a first drafty stuff. And you can be better than that. And we, we you know, that's, that's the thing for us. And David, did you I, would you go running to, not running to in a derogatory way, but would you refer back to to Mark when you were shooting Thorn in the way that Titus talks about referring to Mike? Um, a little bit, but mostly, also you know it was mostly we were having the battles there and then. So Stephen Hopkins was our first director. You know he'd done Twenty Four. Mm. You know he was an experienced television director and film director. So usually my stuff was with him. And I just say, look, I think that, and that would get back to the writers and then we get stuff. Um, you know, the other thing is time is, we have to be appreciative of time because sometimes things get green lit and they'll get green lit on the first, you know, four, maybe four, three or four scripts of a 10 or 25 uh, episode show. So sometimes as you're, as you're rolling, you're writing and it's well, when the ball is rolling down the hill and time isn't on your side, that's when pages are coming at you and you have to be brave enough to just stop the whole machine and say, well, look, should we just all gather a second because I'm not walking on set this morning saying this stuff. So but you, do, that's, you get that. And, and I think most people in, in the industry Want it to be good, you know. They want it to be good, you know. You'll have shouts, but everybody has a drink at the end of the day. Well, they, everybody they, has a drink. Well, you know. But also, D David couldn't refer to me because I wasn't there. I mean, you know, we should decide. We talked about this just just before we went live about the being on set. I think I was on set three times, something yeah. like that, for the whole thing. And it's a bizarre thing because it's my first. I was very excited, obviously hugely excited. And they sent a car, and I remember this car pulling up at the set, and I got out. And the first assistant director getting on the on the walkie-talkie and going, writer on set, 
writer on set, <laughs> right? And I thought, in Mad my Man naivety, on the loose. Mad when, on the loose. in my naivety, I thought that's because I'm important. When in fact they were just <laughs> warning everybody. They were just they, well. They might have all have gone. He's gone. Fucking writer on set. Um, and I, I do remember that. But like, I they gave me a part as a. An, I got an extra role. I got a kind of a supporting artist role. Uh, just walking about in the back of shot in one of the police in one of the station scenes. Uh, but the costume designer and I had to bring a suit with me, right? To try, and the costume designer had no idea that I was the writer at all. And the person wrangling the supporting artist had no idea. So I walked up with the suit and I just said, "Excuse me," and they just went, "Get to the back of the line." And I went, <laughs> oh, okay. And I and I went and stood at the back of the line until eventually the director spotted me and went. I, th I think he can go to the front of the line. But it made me realise that basically, as the writer on set, sure, this is not the experience on Bosch at all, but you're a notch below the caterers in terms of the kind of uh, the, the hierarchy of things. But the weren't you an thing exec as well, Mark? Eh? Weren't you an exec producer on Thorn? Yeah. And they still went, get to the back of the line. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, you're an exec, aren't you, on Bosch? Does that help? I mean, does that make you... I've seen that you've been in the writer's room on set and you're on set a lot. Does that come with the title or does it come through your relationship with Titus? How, how are you more welcome than Mark? <laughs> Just me. Can we mute Mark <laughs> while I answer this? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that, that's, that's the highest credit or most important producing credit in television. It's more of an honorary thing in movies, but... Um, no, I mean, you, you, I've, I've had that kind of uh, experience that Mark has had. Um, and uh, it's, it's really, um, I don't know, it's, it's almost uh, crapshoot to see what happened. But I think because of where I was at when Amazon came and said, let's do this. In the past, I'd given book, I sold books and so forth, and, and they kind of pat you on the head and say, we'll get back to you. Um, but I was so invested in having written Bosch. I was like 20 years into this character and I was doing pretty well on the book front. So I, I didn't need Amazon. I didn't need Hollywood. And I, and I kind of just from the start said, if you want, if you want to take these books, I'm going with them and I'm going to watch over them and I'm going to be wherever I want to be. And, and to their credit, they said, well, we would want you to be there. So that's how that worked. Um, you know, I'm making another show now based on the Lincoln Lawyer series. And I'm, I'm very much welcome, but I just have not been invested as much because Bosch has been the priority. And so I do feel a little like you said, like I haven't heard them yell, writers on set, but I hope <laughs> people like that. That's because it's whispered. David, is it, yes. it's whispered. <laughs> is it yeah. more useful for you as actors if you know the writers are on set? Is it more helpful, Titus? Uh, yeah, 100%. And then there is no... Um, you know, oftentimes they're not on the set. And so, you know, and, and my first meeting uh, uh, was with uh, the producers and, and Mike. But um, when I knew that Mike was going to be there all the time, which he is a, a great deal of the time, if he's not, I mean, the only time I don't see Mike is when he's having to travel the world to promote a new book or he's, or he's off writing a new book. Um, was that uh, is invaluable and, and has been invaluable for me to have Mike there so I could ask him anything um, and and get a, a, a clear and concise answer. And you know the if if I've had any success in in um, putting this character on the screen, it's been having such a close relationship with Mike and and a true uh, collaboration. And you know that that's. You have to have that. Uh, otherwise, you know, you you're in, you're doing Magnum PI or something, and it, it gets it gets diluted and destroyed. And you know, that was the thing that I said when I to to my manager and to a friend when I read the script. And Mike said to me, "Is there anything you want to do?" And I went, "Well, it just really be, came down to a, if it if it ain't broke, there's no need to fix it." And so, um, there the intent of the character and and the heart and the soul of Harry is completely intact. There's, there's not a deviation. I mean, maybe some things that we've added and we've had to move around and we've had to update him because we weren't going to do a period piece um, because of Harry's, the difference in age between myself and Harry. But Mike's, Mike's presence and his friendship and his guidance have, are, are, have been completely integral, 100% to, 
the success of the show on every level. And, and what about you, David? For me, as an actor, was it was it yeah, you're writer on set, or was it fucking writer on set? No, I love Mark being on set. I mean, but you know, for us, it was to do with. I'm sure it's the same with the other guys. It's like so much work is being done before you get to set. It's not like you just turn up there. So, you know, we'd been together for a long time. We'd been working on it. We'd we'd had quite a few false starts getting there, but we knew the tone. We knew the script. We'd we'd sort of had endless arguments and not between us, but between everybody about how we would get there. And then you get, you have great ideas and then the budget comes in and you have to rethink those ideas slightly, you know, but you know, we, all, a lot of our work was done before we started rolling. And certainly when Stephen came on board, you're having production meetings and tonal meetings and all that before you get to the set and, and the casting around the leads, the casting for each episode, you're looking at that. So, you know, you're molding everything before you jump off. And so that you're hopefully that once you're going and you're on set, the, the problems you're encountering are problems of things like weather or a location going on, they're not really script problems. You should have dealt with that way before you've walked on. And um, that was true of us. Uh, I think for those long episode series, you know, as I say, between 10 and 20 episodes, it's keeping an eye, because you're doing double jobs, you're filming, and you're also keeping an eye on the next the episode that's three episodes away and that's that's quite tiring but it's essential for what you're doing and you'll have a showrunner and you'll have all of those people the great thing to say the important thing to say is it's the best job in the world i mean it is i mean it's like the great thing to do it's all the problems are problems of success that you're having when you're in there and that's that's the great thing and and you know you are putting out fires but you're also just having great fun oh, at least we did on our show i'm sure the other guys would say the same you know it's it's just a brilliant ride when you're doing it and you're in the middle of it titus talked about the the heart and soul of harry and keeping that integral to the tv adaptation valerie long's dropped a question for us that alludes to that in the q a box which you'll find at the bottom of your screen and valerie says it's a question for mike Connolly, but i think it, it goes to all of you actually especially to, to you mark as well as a writer and uh, the question is any chance book bosh will one day have a dog like TV Bosch. And I suppose the question is, how much do you add to a character? How much do you find yourself having to change? Perhaps not so much in your case, but Mark, maybe more so in your case for the screen. Mike, do you want to take that one first? Um, yeah, I mean, Titus should actually answer that. It was his idea to have the dog. And um, and I, you know, I'm so far down the road with Bosch. I don't know if um, he'll ever have a dog in the books, but... Um, He's getting to this point of his life where uh, having a companion like a dog might be a good thing, a good good bit of therapy. But I mean, that goes back to one of your first questions. That's something that it's not in the books. It's brought in, and it's been a good thing to bring in. I mean, it's amazing how people react to uh, Harry having a dog. Titus, well, that that idea sort of came out of the. The, the genesis of that was that Harry was going to be undercover and out in the middle of nowhere. And because he is, he's such an isolated person with the exception of his relationship to his daughter, that the idea that he would sort of find this kindred spirit in this dog that was hardy and had survived on its own. Um, it, it, it became sort of Harry's spirit animal. And it, and it also related to um, saving someone. The dog saves Harry's life. He saves the dog's life. They have and the dog saves his life twice. Warns him of um, of danger, and it just seemed to work. And I yeah, you know that that's when I initially brought it up. Um, there, uh, it was sort of wow, well, uh, that can be a pain in the ass, and you know, and then what do we do with the dog? And um, it actually ended up working out really, really well. The dog got so much attention um, <laughs> that I remember one of the first things I posted a picture on Twitter with the dog, and um, somebody said, "If anything happens to that dog, I'll, I'll never watch the show again." Um, and that became an issue later on when the dog runs away. And, when the, when the bad guys come to kill Harry in his house um, and the dog splits and they said the, the, the original draft in the last scene 
um, I read it and, and the dog hadn't come back. And so I called up one of the writers and I said, uh, you, you got to fix that. The, the dog has to come back. No, we kind of want to leave it open. And I went, no, you, you can't do that. And, and it all it was all by design, but it, 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 it kind of, it worked out really, it worked out really, really well. And, and thankfully, um, you know, it wasn't just a flat no and that we were able to kind of talk through it. And that's been my experience. Uh, it's, it's truly collaborative. Uh, in that way and it's not uh, um, it's it's been rewarding I think you know some stuff works and some stuff doesn't but uh, you know as David said you know it's it's also it's it's not on the fly in that way I mean there's there's great consideration and and how that will service I, I had the opposite thing I mean when I've watched books I've I've enjoyed being adapted before I had any experience of it I'd ask those questions I'd go what why is that different where where's this why, why has he got a dog why hasn't he got a this like in the book and it's not until you're on the other side of the fence that you see that these decisions are made for very good reasons you know no it's not like people that adapt books you know are just going we'll change that and we'll cut that and we'll do that um you know, I had a ton of ton of emails and stuff after after Thorn went out, going, "Where's Thorn's cat? Where's where's his bloody cat?" <laughs> um, I don't know. I just didn't have a cat in the thing. Why was it shot in this part of London and not the part of London that's in the books? Probably because it was cheaper to film in that bit of London. And the, the big one: why hasn't there's a character called Phil Hendricks in the books? Why hasn't Hendricks got a shaved head? And like, because the actor didn't want to shave his head. Really quite a simple explanation. I think it's quite a big deal for an actor to shave their head, um, you know, when they're all already auditioning for other parts and stuff. And the actor playing Hendrix just didn't want to do it. But it was like it was some evil plot that, that had been hatched, <laughs> changed the book. But they're different animals. They have to be different. You know, it's, quite, it's oranges and lemons, isn't it? Well, one thing that wasn't said here, like Titus talked about how the dog was open-ended, is because the dog was a really bad actor. <laughs> <laughs> And we and it was very hard to work with the dog and it's and you know making TV is about moving momentum keep moving you got to have uh, actors no matter how big or small their role is that know their their roles know their parts and keep moving and when the dog won't even look at Titus um, because he's looking at his trainer over here everything comes to a crashing end so the dog is great in what we finally got but working with the dog was very difficult. Titus, did you have to have like bits of bacon hidden in your pocket and stuff? <laughs> yeah, no, they, they've got like treats and things like that. The yeah. dog is actually really receptive and and lovely. Um, and it was a, it, and I chose that breed because it was an homage to to Road Warrior. So we that's why we got the the Australian cattle dog. I thought, no, that's a dog that's hardy that could could make it right. Some of the fucking dogs they brought. I, we auditioned <laughs> dogs. There was a three legged dog who was adorable, but they brought these dogs. And I said, this, a hawk or an owl would swoop down and eat this dog. And you're in the middle of, you're in the middle of nowhere. But yeah, you have to have little treats, but he was very sweet. But when the camera would go, because he was green, very, very young, we, the production had to spend, uh, you know, a fair amount of money uh, getting him some training. Cause he was, he was quite young. I had originally selected his dad, but his dad was a bit, they the producers were worried that he might check out so we went for his son but he hadn't been to school yet so it was he's gotten much better now but you know we utilize the dog um in a minimal way but his his presence is still there and, and has seems to have value but yeah well, it's tricky can, to... i hope he can play dead <laughs> <laughs> just kidding yeah. just kidding just kidding don't you don't kill a dog i get it uh, there goes that spinoff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I guess I'll be doing I'll be doing the movie of the week of Old Yeller after this. <laughs> Claire Costa's okay. got a question for Titus and David. It says, did you feel any additional pressure knowing that the characters of Bosch and Thorn were already so well known and so well loved by millions? Did you approach the role differently because of the affection that was already in place? Titus, you first. Well, first of all, Claire Costa, hello. She, Claire has been instrumental in getting the word out in the world about, um, about Bosch and just want to say thank you for all the support over the, over the years. Um, I, I think, you, you know, you, it was, it's a leap of faith. For me, it was just a leap of faith. I felt like that what was there on the page just needed to be serviced. 
And it was not an issue of um, let me let me figure something out. It, it was there, and and so that was that's the great gift. Um, so, not to be obtuse, but that's that's my answer. Yeah, I mean, I I feel, I mean, you feel honestly, you feel pressure for every character you play because you want to sort of honor them. But obviously, it already existed in the books. But because I knew Mark, that was fine, and. I mean, I didn't, I felt more pressure when I was doing The Governor in The Walking Dead because that was, you know, people had a very clear idea of that character. That was the, the they knew what that was going to be and they had to have it. And I knew that we were doing something different with that. So there was more pressure around that. Whereas I had the writer with me and we created a new character in the spirit, in the world. Uh, you know, we honored the character that Mark had written in the books, but we just molded him and made him a little bit different, but it was very much in honor of the character that he created, yeah. I'm, I'm only sorry you never got a Thorn, you never got a Thorn action figure out of it. You got a Walking <laughs> Dead action figure, and I've seen the Harry Bosch action figure. Uh, <laughs> we, didn't, we never got an action figure. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's the pinnacle of success, by the way, for an actor, I'm sure they will agree. That's when you, when you, you go, yeah, I can retire now. It's where my, when my kid said to me, hey, you've got a doll. And I went, it's an action figure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> and we should say, by the way, the Thorn stuff, um, uh, it was October 2010 when it started, when it aired. So if you haven't seen it, and there's one season of six episodes, but it's two stories. It's two of the books in the front three and two of the, uh, the second book in the back three. Then it's on Sky Go. So if you've got Sky in the UK, just go to Sky Go. You can search Thorn with an E, and then you'll be, still be able to watch those. Mike, go on. I'll cut you off. Sorry. Uh, well, because David mentioned the general, I was going to just ask if, if there's a big difference between television production uh, in uh, the two countries, U.S. Uh, for uh, Walking Dead, Thorn for uh, U.K. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a bit of a difference. There's a difference, certainly, with budgets. I mean, I think there's a budget that uh, The Walking Dead had, which I hadn't had on British television. But, and also the difference for me was being in a series that was ongoing. You didn't, I'd never done that before. I'd always done a series that was, uh, you know, six to eight episodes and had a finale and all that, but that was different. But there's no difference in approaching character. There's certainly no difference in time. I mean, you know, I don't know how long you have to shoot an episode, but we, in The Walking Dead, I mean, we were shooting an episode in eight days and that was, you know, so, you, you're at work and that's that was very similar to British television there was no luxury in time you were you were you were at, you were, you were really uh, up against it time wise but no there was no difference in in crews in in the way that people related to you the big difference was food <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the food in America, I mean, craft services. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i shooting a movie at the moment and honestly, nobody's eating on it. It's just crazy. So <laughs> the food in the UK on low budget is not, not, whereas in America, that craft service table, I had to be dragged away from it. You know, that was, that was my big difference. That's right. No Sunday lunch on The Walking Dead. Oh, right? oh no, that was it. No roasty, no roasty. I had to walk away from the, the, the roasting table. It was a beautiful <laughs> food. <Yeah. laughs> Oliver Godby has got a question for all four of you. I don't know if Oliver works in props, but the question is, have you taken any keepsakes off set? Mike Conley <laughs> first. Well, we, um, we wrapped the Bosch show a few months ago. I mean, we're going to do a spinoff, but... It's going to follow the books where Bosch quits and uh, moves on to being a, a private eye. So the detective bureau was kind of up for grabs. And I, I took a few things uh, off of, of Harry Bosch's desk. And uh, uh, I think Titus took the, well, Titus can answer what he took. He took a really good uh, memento. Well, I didn't take it. It was given to me. I, I uh, Mike gave it to me, but it's the, um, it's the original sign, which was made, uh, which was in the homicide um, part of the bullpen. Our, our day begins when your day ends. And it was, um, it was, it was taken from the actual station and everything. And I asked Mike if I could have it. He very graciously gave it to me. Uh, but I frequently steal things from the set. Um, no, I'm kidding. 
Um, <laughs> I do have Mike. Mike gave me uh, many, many years ago. He and Henrik Basson, our other executive producer, gave me um, a replica of Harry's badge, which um, has a very um, special place. But yeah, I got that that sign. I'm looking forward to getting that up and and putting because it it's it's quite something else. A lot of it irritated a lot of fans when I posted it on Twitter. They were like, oh. They're always saying, like, why doesn't Amazon make Bosch um, merchandise? Like, mm-hmm. and, you know, not my call. But, yeah, lots of lots of, lots of of good things. And I what's have to, to say. Stop, I, what's to stop you and Mike setting up the sideline, knocking out some merch? Yeah, that's a sidebar. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the special place for that badge is in the glove compartment of his car. So he can <laughs> when he gets pulled up. <laughs> <laughs> it has that hasn't helped me you want to hear the irony of that is that i actually got pulled over by a cop and um it's in co during covid so i had a mask on and um uh an officer several seasons ago gave me uh, a, a courtesy badge and said if you ever get into you know a jam or something you can and it has a little handwritten note from the cop and everything and um and i wasn't anticipating trying to, to get off, but he pulled me over and said, can I see your license and registration and everything? I'll have my license. My registration was expired. Uh, I had no proof of insurance and I was going 25 miles an hour over the speed limit. And this cop was a Santa Monica cop, wasn't an LAPD cop. So I didn't say anything. I had at one point, I said to my daughter, jokingly, I should take my mask off and maybe he'll he'll cut me a break. And she was furious. She said, don't you dare do that. Um, so after the guy wrote me up and everything, he uh, he looked me right in the eye and he said, and by the way, I don't give a shit that you're Harry Bosch. You still get a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's good. Yeah. David, what about I you? Remember- so yeah. I remember his name. I'm happy to say his name. On no, I'm kidding. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I've kept all my. But I mean, I've played a lot of coppers through my life. So, uh, and I've always kept my ID badge, which I thought was a cute idea to have. But now, when I look through it, it's like my life flashing before my eyes. I'm seeing this young <laughs> man getting older and older and older. It's like the picture of Dorian Gray or something. Uh, but I do keep, I kept that from thought. I had a very embarrassing thing where Mark and I did a Q&A at a theater in, in, in the UK. And before I left, I grabbed something from the wardrobe. I grabbed the coat from the wardrobe and I put it on. And then when I got to the theater, I thought, oh shit, this is Thorne's coat that I took with me. <laughs> I was, I was practically dressed in, in my costume, which I thought was taking it a bit too much. There's people in the audience going, Christ, he's method, isn't he? He's, he's so method. method. He, he turned up for a Q&A in costume. Uh, I felt rather embarrassed by that. But, no, um, he gets thoroughly sorted by people in the UK. They'd be like, what a twat. He's wearing yes, a fucking it costume. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that was a bit bad. I have quite a lot of uh, eye patches from The Walking Dead. I always do take some sort of memento, but like uh, Titus said, they, it's usually given to me rather than me stealing it. But yeah, no. Um, Jenny Porter loved Cry Baby on Audible and says, any plans for future full cast Audible books? It was really good to hear David back as Tom says, Jenny. Mark Binningham? Well, it was a special thing we did because it was the 20th book and it was just sort of a, like a special occasion thing. It was tricky because it was all done under uh, during COVID. So there was a lot of, you know, we're all in different suits. My original concept, if you like, was that we'd all be round a couple of microphones all looking at each other and be able to do it like a, a radio play, but that couldn't quite happen. But it was great to have Dave being Thorne again. That was tremendous. Uh, yeah, I'd love to do it again. I love that experience. I mean, that was, um, again, you know, during COVID, you're thinking, what can one do? How can you get out there? And we were all, it was a very COVID safe recording, but just to be able to get back into the character and do it as an audio was, was a wonderful experience. And is there any chance of the two of you getting back into the character for TV again, or is that, have you written that off? I mean, would that happen now that no, the streaming's come along? Off. No. I mean, we'd, we'd love to do it. We'd both love to do it. Um, and every so often, every so often, you know, that knock again, that knock right, and a posh right. lunch, but you know, Nothing's nothing's come of it yet, but uh, I certainly live in hope. Can I, I say I smell a crossover? I smell a crossover. You've still got the coat, right? 
There could be a crossover. That'd be fucking brilliant. I'm oh, in. Yeah. I'm in. Yeah, and I've still got the costume, so that would be great. Yeah, we got that. Yeah, I'm gonna go put mine on now, and I'll, I'll just wear it for the rest of this bit. <laughs> and tight to see. It's like Dave. Cool. Don't you have the thing like with it when they do the crew shirts and the hats, right? And you, oh, oh. you know, and it, and they're all, particularly when they're when they're nice. Yeah. And you want you go. Oh, I would wear this, but you you can't so, you because can face you imagine face. if you walked up, <laughs> you rock up at the airport. You know, wearing a thorn hat, they'll be like, "What a knob!" That's and they'll be like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." Sorry, yeah. we're going to take away your first class seat, put you in the back. Yeah. That's but it. Even you, you can't even give them away as gifts because you know you look you look a right twat giving them to people with with your face. <laughs> in them. Yeah. yeah, happy Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you put a lot of thoughts into this, mate. Yeah, uh, <laughs> son, wear this to school. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, just what's just happening got, in this crossover? I just got reminded. Sorry, Phil. I just got. I don't think I've ever told Dave. Oh, sorry, Phil. Go on. So we let uh, go on. There's a little delay. I'm sorry. I'll let me just ask this question. I'll come back to you, Mark. All right, mate. In this crossover idea of yours, Titus, is Thorne going to go to LA or is Bosch going to come to London? Bosch goes to London, and Mike can tell you. I, I literally I pitched this idea six years ago, easily six years ago. Mike and I came to the UK to promote the first season of Bosch, and. Um, he and I were doing some show. I think it was on the BBC. I can't remember. And the interviewer said something along the lines of, oh, would you ever consider? And in that moment, it turned into a pitch meeting. And I remember Mike kind of glancing over at me as if to say, you know, you realize that we're on a television show right now. And the whole thing kind of spilled out because I thought it'd be a great idea for Harry. You know, like uh, what was the um, the one with John Wayne where he comes? That Brannigan. not a great... Brannigan. Yeah, yeah, Brannigan. Yeah, not a bad flick, but um, that Harry would go and and um, and of course, and I, I casted the entire thing. I had you know um, Ian McShane and Nesbit and um, I, yeah, a complete. Yeah, Mike and I have had that conversation, and, and so never say never. And now we have even uh, a greater incentive now that we've all met together to do that. It would be a lot of fun. Right, um, it was, it they're was two involved. very interesting. It was a negotiation, and uh, we finally settled on giving Bosch a dog instead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go on, Mark. What were you going to say? Oh, no, it was, it was just a little story. I don't know if I've ever told Dave this, but I, uh, when, when it was announced that Dave was playing the part, I had a meeting with uh, my American publisher, and I went up to the top floor of this big, I'm not going to say with the name of the publisher or the name of the head of the publisher, but one of the big American publishers, and I had this meeting, and he was going, oh, we're so excited that the, the book, and the books are great, and we're, and we're so excited you got David Morrissey. That's so brilliant. And I went, yeah, really thrilled, and I've got my agent with me, my American agent, and I'm very nervous in this huge office, and he goes, and what's, what's so brilliant is that David Morrissey is the, the cousin of Morrissey out of the Smiths. <laughs> and I went, I, I promise you. And I went, no, he isn't. And this guy went, I think you'll find that he is. And, I, and my agent is looking at me like, let this go, let this go, right? And I couldn't, I couldn't let it go. And I went, well, let me just tell you this. David Morrissey is from Liverpool. Morrissey out the Smiths is from Manchester. I know they are. Yeah. And the guy went, 50 bucks. No I, way. I swear to you. He went, he was so convinced. <laughs> he went, 50 bucks. And I went, you're on. Now, not only did I not get the $50, but I got dropped <laughs> two books later. <laughs> I really should have kept my mouth shut. <laughs> That's a great story. Titus, you mentioned the, um, the spin-off. We're getting a couple of questions about that. Hoyt says, how will you have to adapt Harry for the IMDb version? We should just explain then that you're doing this. Mike, you pick up what, what you're doing, and then Titus can talk a bit more about the, yeah. the Harry element. But the IMDb TV have picked this up, which I think we get through the Amazon app, don't we? but it's free. This is not another subscription channel. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's going to be on IMDb, uh, I guess, in North America, which is also a free channel. So it's going to be open to more people. Um, and it's, and it's just great because it's just continuing um, what's going on in the books. And the longer I go with, with Harry Bosch, there's more and more books where he's not an LAPD cop. And, um, and it's just another angle in this character. Uh, you know, he's always felt, when he was a cop, he felt like an outsider with a badge. Now he's completely an outsider. He's not, 
you know, encumbered by all the rules and the politics and the bureaucracy, and, the, and we're going to just see Bosch in a completely different light. And you know, we're working on that. We have a writing room going, and um, and uh, Titus is going to write this time, and it's just really uh, exciting because because it's it's not like season eight. It's definitely a, a reboot with uh, you know our our main character in a different light. Titus. Um, yeah, well, I'm very excited about it, first and foremost. And I've always said to Mike that I love the early books, but I, I there, there's a there's a quality of vulnerability with Harry as he becomes older, and particularly when he leaves the force and becomes a private eye. He no longer has any of the, the, the protections of being an LAPD. And a guy like Harry, when he's left to his own devices, I mean, he can't get a search warrant. So if he's looking at something, he's going to he's going to pick the lock and break in or, or get in. And, you know, he uh, Harry has there's bad blood in the department with him. And when he he leaves the department, um, it's not on the best terms. So there's a lot of people that are happy to have seen him left, but would like to try to continue as he's now a, a private citizen to complicate his life. And when you make a, when you corner a guy like Harry Bosch, um, I think it makes him dangerous. And uh, so I'm, I'm very excited about this, uh, this chapter. And it is, it's a standalone thing. It's uh, obviously it's, it's still Harry and it's a continuation, but it is like Mike said, it's not, it's not season eight. And we find, uh, you know, Harry's relationship with, Honey Chandler developing and Madison Lint's character, uh, Maddie, um, you know, she's, she's gone on to the next chapter. So there's, a, I'm very, very uh, excited. I'm sure I've already said that six times, but uh, <laughs> at the prospect of also just continuing to play a character that is so um, become a part of my own DNA um, a, as an artist, it's a, it's a, it's an enormous gift. So thrilled and when are we going to see that then mike um hopefully by the end of this year we'll, we'll probably start filming mid-june and the final season of bosch on amazon prime is what july or later it, it's just it's probably early summer but they haven't come up with an exact date mm -hmm. Um, we've got uh, about 10 minutes left. So if you've got a burning question, and I've currently got a list of 60, and we're not obviously not going to get through 60, so I'm do, I'll do my best to rattle through as many as we can. Um, then just drop those in the Q&A box. Uh, funny on Twitter, Canada Hardcover says, did nobody send Phil the beard memo? No. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, if I, if I could try, like, for two months, if I knew I was doing this two months ago, I could have tried to grow a beard, and all I look like is the shoe bomber Richard Reed. It just doesn't... It just <laughs> It's not, good look. Not, it's a good look. Yeah. Uh, Kate says, how much do you feel the need to adapt your TV shows to align with current events? Now, Mike, you and I spoke about this on the radio and in the last Mickey Haller book, there is a little bit of COVID reference because uh, the storyline relies on it in a certain way. It sends the clock ticking a little bit. I don't want to give too much away in case people haven't read The Law of Innocence yet, but what, what are your thoughts as, as both as, as actors in a moment, but as, as writers, first of all, to Michael and Mark about involving a global pandemic in what you're writing? Do you do it? Yes or no, Mark? Sorry, me first. Yeah. Uh, no, no, not, not as yet. Um, I've got a book coming in July that, that, that barely mentions it at all. Um, you either have to, you either have to kind of completely embrace it or, or ignore it. And the problem is we don't know what's going to happen next week let alone next year. And it's not like your book comes out a week after you finish it. It comes out up to a year <laughs> after you finish it. And then you end up looking very stupid. And, and some of the TV shows I've seen that have tried to involve, I watched this show, Your Honor, which, which I kind of largely enjoyed, but it was almost like suddenly in the middle of one episode, they went, oh, COVID. And the judge makes a speech about COVID and there's a couple of shots of people in masks. And then it was never mentioned again. And, yeah. you know, I, so I don't, it's a it's a weird thing. I think it's probably also. I'm not sure people want to read about that stuff just yet. You know, I think they probably want to escape from it. Yeah, I mean that last part is is the key. I mean, it, you know, it's a question. Like, and, and TV and books are different animals. I like in the books to reflect that, um, you know, in a limited way. Um, but you know, TV is. I think people really are trying to escape and 
you know, so the season seven that's coming out is, is very clearly set in January. And there's like maybe two references to confusing reports on the media about this plague in China that might come over here. And that's where we leave it. And then when, and when we go to the new show, uh, we're going to jump forward to this summer. And so we'll be coming out of it. Uh, hopefully, hopefully there won't be another wave. And so there'll be slight references, but I'm, I'm, I feel like Mark said, people aren't watching this stuff to, uh, to you know, relive uh, something that hopefully we're past by the time the show comes out. Yeah, um, it's escapism. I mean, that's what we're after. Um, David, someone's asking how your Stoke accent is. I think word's got out that you're filming around those parts, are you? Yeah, it's okay. I'm not going to do it on here, but it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I won't oh, try on, it just now. But yeah, no, we're filming in, in the potteries at the moment, which is uh, very beautiful, actually. So yeah, but I'll uh, you wait and see. It's a thing called the they say, color. They say book, don't they, in Stoke? Yeah, you've they written, do. You've written a book. Yeah, you know, it's all of that. I've got the, I'm surrounded by Stoke actors, so they're all keeping me on message. But it's a, it's lovely with uh, Phoebe Dinover, who is in uh, Bridgerton, mm. and uh, Matthew Good, who we know from The Crown. So it's great. Yeah. All right, just watch, watch really closely now the look on Michael and Titus's faces when I ask David this next question. And where are you filming? Is it up Anley Duck? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is up Anley. Yeah. <laughs> and anything from over the pond anything no no they don't get it <laughs> well, as long as we've given them we've given them it makes my shit itch yeah, yeah, that's, that the yeah. <laughs> that's the takeaway yeah that's the takeaway i think yeah. uh, that's going to become a uh, a catchphrase around the world basically. <laughs> yeah just, just to hey, confirm that's not a symptom of coronavirus hey, you know oh, look at that fucking... There I'm not a go. fucking novice here. You want me to go get my lady? She's from yeah. London. We want to start some shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all right, man. I've seen the picture of you behind you with a gun. I'm cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Tracy says, for Titus and David, are there any other characters from novels that you'd love to play or books that you've read and you think, oh, I'd love to play that character? David? Well, yeah, I mean, loads of books. I mean, it's a great book that stops me thinking like that, actually. You know, most books I read that as a male protagonist, and I think, I could do this. <laughs> this is me. You know, so it's uh, there's a great, it's always a good book that stops me thinking like that. But yeah, you know, I mean, uh, all the time. Well, I've, that, the, pandemic, the pandemic thing is quite interesting because I just finished reading I Am Pilgrim. Oh, uh, yeah, Terry Hayes. And there's a great, there's, you know, obviously written before any sort of pandemic, but there's a whole storyline in that about, you know, the idea of, although it's obviously a terrorist act is, is about pandemic. But yeah, I, I, I read a lot and a lot of the books I read, I think I could do this. <laughs> so that's probably my arrogance rather than anything else. What about you, Titus? No, I think it's, it's uh, I mean, I agree. So often you read books and, and, and uh, as an actor, at a certain point, you do you start to think I could I could I could do this, or I'll, I'll, I end up casting the movie, um, you know, with actors that that I uh, that I fancy think that would really come in and do a great job. I think everybody does that though. When you read a book, you start to sort of create some sort of, particularly if there's no um, no physical description, uh, it's kind of uh, it's colored the way that I read um, you know fiction now. Um, not so much with, with nonfiction, obviously, but yeah, there, there's always that thing. And then, you know, then I, I'll reach out and, to my manager and say, Hey, well, let's, let's try to get the rights to this. And they go, yeah, yeah. Uh, forget that. That's, uh, you know, Shane Black has the rights to that. <laughs> the one thing I haven't asked you yet, uh, which we should touch on is the importance of music to both of your characters so i'll come to michael and mark first on on that uh, mark with you and thorn it's country isn't it and I, I read something where you said you you made thorn like country before country became cool because it's kind of getting a resurgence again isn't it it's getting its own radio two and radio two country here and that kind of thing but it's country stars hitting the o2 it, it's bigger well i i made thorn a country fan because i'm a country fan and i didn't want to work too hard um but also because when people say they like country music they, it tends to provoke a reaction it tends to be, oh, cowboy music and twangy guitars and big hats and rhinestones and dead dogs and drunks. And, and I'm like, yeah, uh, what's not to like? Um, but it's, <laughs> the, the interesting thing is, in terms of the TV adaptation, 
my one piece of input really early on was that I gave the director a playlist. Um, I said, you know, Thorn likes country music. And, and actually I could see his eyes slightly glazing over as I started talking about George Jones and Hank Williams and whatever it was, but I gave him a playlist. And, and the, for me, one of the best moments in, in Thorn is when there's a scene when he walks into, the, into his flat uh, and uh, and there's a wonderful song called Satan is Real by the Louvin brothers, which was on my playlist. And I, and, and I just went, that's so right. It was the only, you know, made me so happy to finally see that. It was the one thing I, I cared about, you know, once I'd got the actor that I wanted, the only other thing I was, was keen to get was some, was some music I liked, you know. Mike? Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, a way of um, delivering character in books. I mean, it's funny, in books, you don't hear the music, but you can definitely use music preferences to, to you know, brush on the stroke of character. And, uh, you know, jazz was not really my music. It was my father's, um, you know, but I did research and got into it. So I could say it's my music now, but when I first put it in the books, it wasn't. Um, but, it, but it works, you know, Bosch is, again, he's in a big organization, but he feels like an outsider, feels like a loner and, and jazz is, just fits that kind of uh, uh, character. And is that extra work for you, for you actors then to, to embrace another side of the character? I mean, Titus, is jazz your thing anyway? Or have you, have you had to get to know it to fit Bosch? No, jazz has always, I mean, I love music and jazz has always been a thing. But, and like Mike, my father um, loved jazz and had an, uh, an encyclopedic knowledge of jazz, in which I, I didn't possess, but um, I listen to a lot of jazz and, um, you know, those are the, those are the little Easter eggs and, and the books for people who love the music when they read the Bosch books and also people who watch the show. And so often people say, Oh, what, you know, can you create a playlist so we can, um, you know, they, or, or people who have n no understanding or experience of jazz, they watch our show and suddenly they find themselves being kind of drawn into that gravitational pull and and want to know so i think it's uh, and and it is i think it's like mike said it, it it's very very um the whole idea of jazz and and, and what it is 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 really demonstrative also as, uh, as the, the the character traits of harry very much kind of an outside away from the mainstream there's an improvisational quality a lot of times in the way that he operates so it really serves the character beautifully and what about and you, it's Dan? also just great music yeah and with Thorns Country? Yeah, I mean, I was a country fan anyway, so we sort of uh, chimed on that. I used music a lot in all my work. I mean, I, I just, I often think about my character's playlist that he would listen to. And I use music on set a lot because, you know, sometimes as an actor, you have to be on set, but everybody else has to be doing their work. So I'll stick my buds in and I'll just focus on some music and, and that'll keep me around without being you know miles away from the set but it keeps me focused as well so I use music a lot and I thought the country music thing was interesting because you know it's 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 Americana as well as far as this is a British show but they had this guy had this sort of obsession with Americana and the stories of America so it felt like he wanted to be somewhere else and he just that was good for me and also you know it was the it was great music and music of heartbreak and and a lot of you know the other thing for me with the country we were using was there was a lot of women in it there was a lot of great songwriters who were women and talking about their story and that sort of had a great thing about it as well so yeah I was I was that was like Mark I was so glad that that was uh, kept in but it was also something that really I could build the character from as well slightly like you were saying before that outsider sort mm. of mentality really Here's a good question from Thomas Shevlin, who says, for Titus and David, do either of you get annoyed if a fan spots you and they call you Bosch or Thorn rather than your real names? Titus? No, not at all. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm very, uh, I, I love Harry. So I, I, I share, I, I share a great adoration of that character. So for me, it's a, it's a compliment and I'm very proud of the show that we've made. So, and it happens a lot. Um, and particularly with, with, with coppers, they'll pull up and and take the piss out of me and and call me Bosch and um, no, doesn't it doesn't bother me at all. If they're if they're completely pissed, 
in, in a restaurant and come and try to sit on my lap or take a selfie, <laughs> yeah, I might get a little bit agitated and people get hurt. But other than that, no, not at all. Yeah. <laughs> Does that happen if people try to do that? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Really? Wow. Yeah. I'm sorry about that, man. I just had any more than three Stellas and I'm out of it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, David, what about you? Yeah, no, I, I don't mind it. I mean, I mind it when my kids do it. But, you know, when, when, my, family, when my family get confused, I get a bit, <laughs> I get a bit pissed off. But no. Well, I, uh, I was, I remember yeah, I mean, hanging I, out. I, I was what? hanging out with you a bit, Dave, when The Walking Dead was, you know, and that was yeah. mental. I mean, that was just bonkers, wasn't it? The it attention is, but it's cruel. Cool. I mean, honestly, I mean, like Titus said, those incidents that he describes, they happen. They're quite rare. I mean, they yeah. happen every now and again, and that's it. And you deal with it. And But 99% of the time, people are very respectful. Also, it helps with the governor because, uh, you know, playing a real badass means that people think twice about coming yeah, over yeah. here sometimes. But, um, yeah. yeah, I you know, I, it's all gravy for me. I love it. And um, it's not, it's never been a chore. And when it is a chore, you just deal with it. But it's quite rare. I've referred to it once, but we are getting quite a few questions in the chat, Titus, about who is the man behind you in in the portrait. But I said it was you. Steve McQueen. Like no, that's that's McQueen. That's um, that's a picture of him. Um, I'm drawing a, a a blank and having a a, a junior senior moment um, of the photographer. But it's um, it's a photo that um, my girlfriend uh, got from me as a gift, and it's a, it's a real iconic picture of him with his. 357 python uh, sitting in his living room so there you go sue and everybody else who bombarded the uh q a thing we've only got we've literally got about two or three minutes and then steve and luke who organized this amazing thing i'm just going to pull the plug so before the plug gets pulled a number of people wanting more detail from you titus and you mike as to what we can expect in the in season seven which we haven't seen yet of bosch and also in the bosch spin-off so do you want to just whet some appetites mike you first well, we don't want to give stuff away, but um, the, the season seven book is um, uh, The Burning Room and, uh, and the uh, spinoff, we're going to go with The Wrong Side of Goodbye. And, and these are just baseline things. You've been watching the show. You know, we bring all kinds of new stuff in, unique stuff, and, and we, you know, extrapolate from there. So these are really just kind of uh, blueprints to start with. Titus, anything to add? Um, just to say that I think it's a it's a very very strong season without giving anything away. Um, different levels of peril for characters and uh, some interesting evolution for other characters. And uh, I'm really proud of this season and uh, and and moving forward with the uh, with the spinoff. As Mike said, wrong side of goodbye. Um, people always said, you know you can extrapolate from that how how much or how little we'll we'll use from that book, but. Uh, I can assure you it, it it will be a good ride. So buckle up. And Mark, just um, tell people about Rabbit Hole, which is your next book coming out in the summer. Uh, yeah, it's a standalone. Um, and it's also the first time I've written a book in the first person. So God knows I'm entirely inside the head of a, a young woman and the entire whole book is set on a psychiatric ward. That's about all I can say about that. Very good. Uh, and David, you were telling us briefly about the film before we started to bully you into doing a Stoke accent, but... <laughs> yeah, I'm doing a film at the moment called The Colour Room, uh, which is all about the ceramics artist Clarice Cliff. And the uh, third wow. season of Britannia comes out, uh, I think, in a couple of months' time. So, yeah. Oh, back in the toga. Back in the toga. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I said, did you get that's those? Called, that's called COVID wear. Yeah, <laughs> COVID wear. <laughs> yeah back on the horse oh yeah uh lita weissman says i don't have a question i just want to say sincere thanks for an incredible panel and i echo that um sincere thanks on behalf of me and of steve and luca to four amazingly talented people who've given up their time for us this evening so that we can raise some money for the trust or trust and for food banks which is hugely important to so the superb david morrissey the most excellent titus welliver the amazing mark billingham and the always fabulous mike Codley. it's been a real honor for me chaps so thank you for letting me toss thanks, some questions Bill. your way i've really really enjoyed it from the heart thanks for having us thank uh, let me just tell you fun. some important things before Great we say fun. goodbye first of all then uh if you've got a ticket for this tonight that will 
qualify you for 30% off the books of all the writers that feature in the festival. And there's over 50 writers in this festival this weekend at Waterstones. And you'd have been sent a link on email. Uh, if you haven't had that, then just uh, drop the boys uh, a line at Twitter where you can find them, uh, two crime writers and a microphone. It's at two crime writers, not the number two, but the word two, T-W-O, at two crime writers. You'll be able to get your discount code 30% off every writer's book that appears at two crime writers and a microphone. This festival is over 50 of them. So let me tell you that first of all. Let me thank Steve Cavanagh and Luca Vesti who put this lineup together, who are amazing people getting the best crime writers to entertain you and to raise money for the Trussell Trust. And our thanks to the Trussell Trust as well. And I think that's all the announcements. I'm just going to say what an honour it's been one more time. I'm going to lie in the darkened room and get over it. The boys have got to go back to work. And Mark, you were doing a quiz now, right? In about 10 minutes. In about 10 minutes time, yeah. So that's the I'm next go, session. Go and grab a beer. Yeah, go and grab a beer <laughs> and enjoy the rest of this weekend. Oh, and if you've got someone, if you've got a friend who thinks, oh, I would have loved to have, my friend would have loved to see Mike and Mark and Titus and David and they've missed it. They haven't missed it. Buy a ticket now, and they'll be able to watch it on playback. All ticket holders will get this on playback. So it's not too late to tell your friends to part with £20, and then they'll be able to catch this session again. Thank you very much, gents. What an honour. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. 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 Bye.